Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Breen. I'm the screenwriter and producer of Serpentine Pink, co-producer. Um, thank you for coming to our Instagram Live event, our second one. Uh, we've had one yesterday with Kristen, um, the actress, producer, choreographer, and today we're doing it with Sabina Zuniga Varela. So let me ask Sabina to join. Sabina. So I sent Sabina the invite. There you are. Hi. Hello, hello. Hi. What's going on? I'm melting. You I'm are. Melting. Oh, no. It is so hot in LA. Yeah, it's really hot here. We're so privileged to have air conditioning. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll send you cool vibes. Cool, sending you. you cool vibes. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited to talk to you. Totally. Yes. Yes. Oh. Hello, everyone. Oh, my gosh. Kai. Hi. Yes. Hi, Kai. Hi, Jay. Hello. <laughs> Nathan. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Nathan. From Denver. Yay. Our moms are on here. Our moms. Hi, um, mom. So I don't know if you noticed, but I'm dressing in character as Jamie. <gasps> Amazing. As much I have... as I don't have a cow cowgirl hat, but. I have so much love of your bandana, bandana collection. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Bandanas. Yeah. Oh, um, hi, Nathan. Hi, Nathan. All right. Um, yesterday I wore soft pink colors for Henrietta. And today I'm doing more of a violet. I don't know. Jamie's always been very red to me, but um, mm -hmm. for some reason, maybe it was your headshot. I liked the gray kind of violet vibe as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Great. So thanks Thank everyone you. for joining. So this is our second in a series of I'm interviewing Serpentine Pink performers. And then later I'm going to interview designers, directors, producers. And, um, and so today we're interviewing our co- <laughs> That's great. Today we're going to, and I'm going to interview my friend, my muse, my um, partner in creative crime and, uh, the main one of the instigators of Serpentine Pink, the play and the movie, um, Sabina Zuniga Varela. So welcome. Hello. And so the story follows two leads, two uh, characters. Um, it has four four main characters. Um, but uh, I was telling I was telling um, I've told you this story many times. We know the story. I posted it earlier that when I was first writing Serpentine Pink. Uh, it started because I found a pink leaf in the rain on concrete. And well, my friend had asked me to write something, um, an adaptation of a Grand Guignol play. So I had that in my mind for his company in Chicago, Chris Peak. Hey, Chris Peak. Um, and I saw this leaf and it was pink and it had like serpentine scales in it. And I started describing the energy of that person, who that person would be. And I started to write a poem about um, this character Jamie and I realized when I was doing it that I was describing you and that I was describing <laughs> or you as her you as her but kind of you as well um so I just wanted to give people that background that your inspiration for me started the whole story um and the whole energy of it um mm. yeah it's but, such a great story I know and visual too it's it's responsible for the title um but I wanted to tell people how we know each other. Similar to Kristen, USC uh, MFA school. You were, Kristen was a grade above me, but you were grade under me. Yep. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. we knew each other at USC, um, but we didn't really connect closely until you were cast in my thesis reading. That um, was my first professional job in Los Angeles. It wow. was in, be in between my first year of grad school and my second year of grad school. I got a call from Luis Alfaro, mm -hmm. who said, sorry for the sirens, uh, <laughs> an actor had to leave because they booked a national commercial and there's this great reading of it. This is, <laughs> uh, is a like a sequel of The House of Bernarda Alba. And the role was Martirio, which I had actually played that role. Oh, you had? Albuquerque. Oh, um, I didn't know that. In an, I in know a, that? Yeah, I did that in uh, two. Gosh, 1999, maybe 2000. Wow. And so that play was the first introduction for me into your very visceral, poetic way of writing. And I was hooked. Awesome. They agree. And you <laughs> vibed just like, like Kristen, like you just vibed so well with the language. And it's such a treat, it's such a fine a gift for a writer to find somebody 
who a performer and a creator who um, understands what you're trying to do with the language and just kind of dives in and and the visceral aspect of it too so it was a it was a partnership made in the desert that is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then like with so I when we started to do the workshop reading we did a workshop reading at, at um so you of Angels? You should never say village, but we did a very, very early reading with Olan oh, at yes. Company of Angels. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and then it just grew from there. And thank you for mm -hmm. continuing on the journey with us. Heck yeah. Well, you know, when we decided to do Serpentine Pink as a play a decade ago, we went full board. Nathan Singh, who's here with us, uh, Kristen Condon, who is who plays my my love in the movie and you and myself, we actually created our theater collective right. because of this script, um, By the Souls of Our Feet is our theater mm -hmm. collective. And we did a whole Kickstarter, raised money, and thank the theater gods, Dionysus and all for the <laughs> Son of Semele people yeah. for inviting us to their company creation festival. And Nathan mm -hmm. Singh directed the hell out of that play. <laughs> um, it was epic. It was epic. It was one of the most Duende. amazing theatrical when they filled experiences I've ever mm -hmm. had and that was just and it's yeah I cannot believe it's a film now I know it's so exciting and just the family the Serpentine Pink family has grown so big uh with the making of the film so many incredible artists designers crew people everybody um so thanks everyone for this so I wanted to dig into dig into Jamie the character of Jamie mm -hmm. um so I, I'm going to do the same thing I I did to Kristen yesterday. I yeah. am been describing her, but I want to know how you would describe her. So she's the one who's seen as the instigator. She's the one who throws acid onto her love's face, Henrietta, who Kristen plays. Um, and then we see her journey towards um, kind of reconciling with what she did. Um, and we mm -hmm. learn all, all about her throughout the process of the movie, her trauma and pain as well. So how would you describe her? Well, you know, I was just reading this novel recently that's about a group of people going through this trauma and something happened. And one of them, you know, they're trying to understand why somebody would do something so violent to someone they loved. Right. They couldn't process it. And one of the characters just very simply said, well, hurt people hurt people. Mm. And, you know, not to give any excuse for the violence that comes out of Jamie, but to just kind of give an invitation to dig deeper mm -hmm. into where do we actually learn to hurt others where mm -hmm. does that actually come from and sometimes we don't even know and it becomes something so um explosive and irrational that it's it's very hard to contend with not only for the others around you that you're affecting but inside yourself right so i definitely feel that jamie is um she is a walking talking storm yeah of past present and intrusive thoughts that continue to spin her into situations and thoughts and that very, uh, you know, paranoid kind of what we see in a lot of domestic violence partners of just not living in the reality that their partners are living in and trying to have control yeah. over something because they themselves to have connect. definitely lost control. Yeah, and that's their yeah. way of connecting. Sometimes yeah. that violence for them is a connection. Well, uh... That's fascinating. Is it because it's a way of gaining control or power or? Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a myriad or... of things. Yeah, yes. it definitely is. It's an immediate, it is an immediate connection. I mean, if you think mm -hmm. about the force of laying a hand on somebody, that's an immediate connection. It's a visceral connection, right? We do the same with words. Mm -hmm. but when, we, when we just spew something out, it, we can immediately see the impact on somebody so we know we're being heard. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's a bit of connection, a bit of a power and a control thing. Um, yeah. But then also there are times when it's just a reaction without an intention behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Almost like uh, that was so fascinating because I was just watching an interview where actor was describing his character as being his own worst enemy that he is the antagonist to himself he's the protagonist and the antagonist mm -hmm. himself um mm -hmm. and that's an element of noir he said um yeah. which i that dynamic. immediately thought of jamie in that yeah she's in her own way um, well and you know 
what's really beautiful about the transition between the staged version and the film version is in the stage version, it all happens so fast. I, I mean, our, our film is also quite contained, but we have such an amazing ability to go a little bit further and deeper dynamically. Mm -hmm. During the filming of it, I found so many more facets of Jamie, mm. some tenderness, some yeah. real childlike moments. Vulnerability. Vulnerability that um, I wasn't really coming from those places in the staged piece you know in the staged piece it was a lot of force a lot of mm -hmm. just animal coming from that root chakra of just like right <laughs> survival like that's mm -hmm. it so it was a beautiful experience transforming it onto to the medium of film and going deeper what do you think helped that was it the desert was it because another thing i wanted to ask you was i'll never forget that first reading that we did at um company of angels it, it was like a rehearsal reading or something it was just like a cold reading or something um i remember you showed up in costume like with mm -hmm. all the, you had you already had all the jamie clothes uh all the jamie accessories and i was wondering if you kind of based your interpretation of jamie off of anyone that you because you grew up in albuquerque new mexico and that, mm -hmm. did you know women like jamie um yeah I, you know i was thinking about Growing up in Albuquerque, you know, small town, but I also grew up in northern New Mexico, in a very okay. rural town. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother worked with a lot of very strong, talented, creative, incredible women. And a lot of it was boots and jeans. There's one woman in particular, I remember she had really, really long hair. There's another woman I remember who always had red lipstick and amazing earrings. You know, there's another woman I remember who had a relationship with a woman. And when I was very young, it was my kind of first um, introduction of seeing two women oh, wow. you know, be in partnership. Mm -hmm. And so I've been surrounded and I'm surrounded by matriarchs in my life, just so many women. So it's definitely an amalgamation of all the strong women and being a desert rat. You know, mm -hmm. it's not that we're not the same desert as like Sedona, the Mojave, all of that. Right. High desert. So it's a yeah. little bit different. It's a How little is different. it different? I'm fascinated. Well, because I've been there, higher. but I, I haven't spent yeah. enough time there to know the difference. We have a lot more weather. We have higher mountains. We have snow. We have skiing. We have big, big trees. You know, we have so many different temperate zones. And it's just different energetically. Uh, you know, some of the rock in the area of New Mexico predates Pangea. It's been out of the water for a very long time. Yeah. And it just has this energy. You know, it's called the land of enchantment, and there is some heavy truth to that for mm -hmm. sure. And transitioning over to the desert, like Joshua Tree, that's a whole other planet, even for this desert rat. Yeah, you know, and it looks like Mars. The, we it were looks out like there. some other total yeah. planet. Yeah, when for the play, we went and took all those amazing production photos. Um, Brayden Moran, Brayden Moran, yeah, thank you for the <laughs> captures to to attempt to bring the feeling of of that Mojave Joshua Tree. Into, into our theatrical space. So then spending two weeks on the most amazing locations, shout out to the production team, holy hell. Yeah. We were, we were shooting in some of the weirdest, I mean, I was in a ditch at three in the morning, <laughs> you know, looking up at the, so many stars, it was freezing. It was fucking freezing, sorry. Um, <laughs> it was so cold. The desert gets so cold at night, you know. So the environment of shooting on location in those spots that the production found for us really, really informed and, mm -hmm. and deepened Jamie for me. As, oh, it's like, so vital. It's so vital yeah. to the movie to have that landscape and to have those locations. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So, so how, because you, you filmed a movie, correct me if I'm wrong, but you filmed a movie in New Mexico when you were at school? An indie movie yes. or something? I, I, did a, I did a few. My first, first, first ever film was by Ramona Emerson. She's amazing, amazing native filmmaker, uh, now novelist. She just debuted her first mystery novel called Shudder. It's great. Uh, about two sisters on the Navajo reservation. Um, I participated in a lot of little indie films. I directed a feature <gasps> starring uh, Kim, who's who's joining us. Uh, I want to see uh, it. Unfortunately, the producer and the uh, the DP had a parting of ways, and I have no idea where oh, the material is. Okay. So maybe in like twenty years, it'll research. Okay. This and you'll, get, you'll get to see my directorial debut. Yeah. But yeah, there's so much amazing filmmaking that uh, was going on in New Mexico. Yeah. I'm still, it's become yeah. this hotbed of TV and film 
shooting and locations. And well, it's the West, um, right? I mean, mm -hmm. think about Westerns. Think about like the element that we have in our film. We have this gorgeous Western mm -hmm. like theme kind of running uh, under it, filmed in Pioneer Town and yeah. this whole John Wayne thing. And it's just, it naturally lends itself to this Southwest land. And being a Southwest girl, it's just like, boom, mm -hmm. you know, kismet. Yeah, yeah, it worked out perfectly. Um, so was, was shooting the movie, shooting, I'm interested in, I mean, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but shooting in the high desert, is that like, how did it affect your character work in terms of shooting in the Mojave um, as Jamie? Because yesterday I asked Kristen, you know, she's such a tender character. She's such a, mm -hmm. you know, um, she has her strengths, but that is kind of a contrast to the harshness of the Mojave Desert. You know, it's dry, it's, um, you know, so hot, it's lonely, it's isolating, it's strange. So how did the landscape feed your performance of Jamie, do you think? Well, you know, I think being able to actually have that dirt on you, mm -hmm. right? I spent a lot of time in the dirt. <laughs> there was so many times where I was like, again, Jamie's in the dirt. What is going on here, right? Um, and just to actually, you know, one thing that really I thought was so profound, and this is on a technical level, as an actor coming to a set, and the production team really shared with us how to specifically take care of the land we were shooting on. Mm. Because the Mojave Desert and that area is a huge part of the ecosystem of this planet and specifically mm -hmm. the Southwest. And the more and more people walk through certain areas, they're kicking up and disrupting the process of absorbing carbon right. out of the atmosphere. And so we were instructed, please stay on the paths that we have designated, wow. yes. right? Do not go wandering off because also we had snakes, right? Um, and so learning from locals and being connected with locals, which is another amazing thing the production team did, really let us understand that this is a sacred place. Mm -hmm. So as an actor, I took that on and then that infused Jamie with knowing if she's from there, that's something interesting. That's yeah. something igniting to know that she also has that knowledge. Right. She may be a hot mess, but she knows how to interact with the land. Yeah. Right? And I, yeah, that reminds me of that scene you have with Michael Harris who plays Shaman, yeah. where you're like, I mean, you know, it's kind of a, a little bit of a spoiler, but he's, I mean, it's his name Shaman, but he's learning to be a, a healer, um, mm -hmm. where you call him out and say, hey, you're not really a shaman, that's sacrilege, uh, mm -hmm. sacrilegious. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that that's a big part of it too. But at the same time, you go and mess up the landscape and he corrects you and says, yes. you have to go. And I love that element in the in the movie, how the special effects and the sound effects kind of um, blow up the supernatural aspects, the spiritual aspects of the of the movie, too. And so, um, yeah, I love that that element is already in there. Of, yeah, I mean, you know, that's the thing that's crazy about your writing, Megan, is you give such a challenge to whether it's being done on stage, and Nathan can attest to this, how do we bring your your, you have special effects written into your poetry, mm. written into your stage directions. I mean, for me, some of the most insight you can get into a writer, especially a playwright or a screenwriter, is the way they write stage directions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a scene where I'm in a graveyard, a biker graveyard. I'm pissed. I'm looking for something. And I grab a, somebody's item off of their grave and I toss it. And you write in that it all of a sudden glows, it emanates with this blue, right? It's like, how the, you know, and they did it mm -hmm. and they were doing it live. They weren't doing it after the facts. This wasn't a special effect that they put in after the movie was shot. We were sitting in the middle of the desert and there were all these people and I'm holding on to this necklace that I'm throwing. And we did so many takes where I threw it. And then as soon as it landed, they lit it up in a, spec so in cool. a special way right until they nailed it yeah and then it was amazing I went in to do some ADR for that specific scene and I saw what they had done and mm -hmm. I about like, mm -hmm. it's so exciting I was just like this so is so excited for people to see it yeah oh my god yeah it's 
for those of you that are going to get to see it, just know that a lot of the special effects that were done were done way before editing. It was done as we were filming. I was sitting in a ditch and they were above me projecting the galaxies and stars on my hands so that I actually was reacting to these weird ass lights like on my hands and, you know, our, our amazing camera woman's right behind me. And it was just so creative and profound. I'm so I'm so excited for people to see it. It's yeah, because that, that is always as a screenwriter and um, a co-producer of the movie myself. It's that's something that was always I was always wondering and concerned about is you know how do we make this magical world in with um, a lower budget? Um, but the team is so creative. They're so they imaginative and um, it's mm -hmm. really it's really kind of magical what happens in the movie. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, I was thinking yesterday when I was listening to the IG Live, I was thinking back to, you know, those amazingly brave filmmakers and cinematographers who just decide to take on something and create, I, I can't stop but thinking of Altered States, right? It's, it won the Oscar for uh, special effects back in the 80s it's with, I'm blanking um, on the proof. I think William Hurt, he plays this, oh, yes. or this mm -hmm. teacher, mm -hmm. right? And decides to do like a flotation tank and takes ayahuasca and all this stuff. And just like what they decided to do with that story that also combined a lot of desert elements and indigenous mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm going to watch this tonight. Oh, it was just like a feast for the eyes. It was, a, mm -hmm. it was incredible. And I just watching some of the trailers for our film, I, you know, it doesn't quite have its own genre, but I'm getting little hints of all mm -hmm. these other amazing things, you know? Yeah, it is drawn from that. I think that it is, you know, very telling of the um, the team that, that made this, um, Larissa and um, Hard Knock Productions and Ron mm -hmm. Hanks and, um, yeah. is this, you know, does take a type of courage to make something like this. And um, it's just so exciting as a writer and somebody interested in film and storytelling that is I've been I've been told it's weird and experimental. I don't think it's that weird and experimental. Maybe maybe because it's I'm totally weird, but, weird um... and experimental, but in the best <laughs> but, way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm so grateful for everybody who's taken this story on and and really been excited by it instead of intimidated by it. I think that's yeah, really exactly. telling. Of a, it was very a front foot. Everybody mm -hmm. was just Vivian. Standing. Yeah, the director. Oh my God, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So great. Okay. So. Let's move on to the animal totem. So I love, as you know, I love animals and I love them in mythology. I always have an animal in my mm -hmm. writing, in my works. Um, lizards make a big appearance consistently. Um, cats, for some reason, always make an appearance in my poems, like variations of cats, um, mm -hmm. tigers and lynx and jaguars. And so a movie set in the Mojave, of course, is going to have some animals in it. Um, yeah. And so very early on, your animal totem was a snake, is a snake mm -hmm. um, for mm -hmm. me. But I was wondering, um, was it, was for you, was, was Jamie's totem always a snake? Or was it something else? Or has it evolved well, with I, the movie? Or I think that... You know, there's there's always jokes made about actors who sit in a room and, and, you know, imitate animals to, like, try to explore themselves. And there's something, yes, we do do that. We mm -hmm. actually do do that. It is part of, like, getting yourself out of your body into this, into this space of how can I inform my character outside of my own head and connect it with something. And animals are such a beautiful uh, portal into that. I think that for the when it was a play, I kind of fluctuated between different, you know, there was a lot of uh, wolf. There was a lot of wolf. M mostly they were all predators. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> were what I was using for, for Jamie, some hawks. Um, even though she doesn't like hawks, there's something inside of her. A lot of times yeah. we don't like things that are inside of us. But for the- Well, films, Stella's last name is Hawk as well. Stella, yeah, and I said, don't talk to me about hawks. And, also, <laughs> yeah, and, a, and a hawk took my, my dog Butterfly. Mm -hmm. Jamie's dog. Um, so there's that whole thing. But for the film, I very much uh, entered into the world of keeping that snake totem. I had a beautiful ring that she wore on her thumb that was a snake wrapped around. And one of the most beautiful things that we got to do in the film 
was you had written in, and this was in the play as well as in the in the screenplay, the image of your totems, your deer, and your snake mm -hmm. dancing. Mm -hmm. It's like how the our hair and makeup artists, oh my god, our costume designers. Kristen was literally the most gorgeous deer I've ever seen. And then I was transformed. I just found my time lapse of when they did my makeup to turn me into the snake. Oh, wow. So we got to become our totems in mm -hmm. this film. And Kristen choreographed. We were in this driveway of the Airbnb with Vivian, um, our director, the first night. Uh, we all hung out, had some food got to know each other in the next morning. We just went out into the driveway and we worked on this piece. What would it look like to see a, a deer and a snake dance together? Love it. And that, that was the first day. So that mm -hmm. definitely established um, a through line where I, I stuck with that snake, the way snakes strike, the way they kind of curl up, the way they very much are informed by the environment around them, hot and cold. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that was, yeah. was wrapped up and coiled in there. I love that. I love that you infuse that in your work. You can definitely see it as well. Um, that back and forth and the duality of um, of Jamie um, being both visceral and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, I love the alliteration, but I love the duality as well. Um, and yeah, is there... Um, yeah, I, I just, I love how you and Kristen went head, head first into those animal totems and how, um, I was wondering if anybody watching, do you guys have any animal totems that you really connect to? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, let us know in the comments. And <laughs> of course, if you guys have any questions for Sabina, um, we have about 10 minutes left. I mean, if you have any questions for Sabina, put them in the comments and we'll get to them. Um, great, yeah, so, so um, here's the, another question that I wanted to ask you. You kind of talked about it a little bit, but mm -hmm. I love so much how you are an actor's actor. You love, um, well, you, you know about, I'm not sure that you love, but you definitely uh, are very insightful about acting techniques. Um, it's been such a, such a big part of your teaching and your, mm -hmm. we'll talk about animal totems, Clover's barking. Um, she wants to <laughs> say hello. Um, but, um, um, so, but one of the things that I love about you is how much you love Chekhov and mm. how Anton Chekhov, the 19th century uh, playwright, Russian playwright, who a big part of his work and his, uh, the actors who, and people who create his work is this idea of enduring suffering. Um, and uh, how humans move through suffering. And I was wondering if that affected, did you take that on as an acting technique when performing Jamie? Um, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but is there, was mm -hmm. there any type of that while you were performing Jamie in the film? Did it evolve from the play to the film at all or? I yeah, I mean, suffering is an interesting universal, you know, human experience that when coupled with a specific situation, such as a toxic relationship, the suffering can fluctuate back and forth between mm -hmm. blaming somebody else for it mm -hmm. and then taking it on very internally. And there are some moments that what I love about the film is being able to get up and close with these characters. There's one moment in the trailer where it's uh, during the bathtub scene where Henrietta, Henrietta and I had been taken about. Oh, and she so I just got we, chills. We get in a fight. So powerful. Yeah. And just sitting there in this, the everything was going just right. And then I picked a fight, right? I picked a fight and she leaves. And there's just this moment. I go ahead and continue the fight, of course, because that's Jamie. But there is this moment where that suffering, I really took, oh, God, I fucked it up again, right? Mm -hmm. and I just really so it's not pure rage focused on somebody else and pure like you're making me it was a moment where I was just like oh and that battle that again that duality between mm -hmm. the suffering and we see that in Chekhov we see that in the choices that people make based on 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 the position that they're in how do they decide to deal with their suffering a lot of times they just stand there and talk about it mm -hmm. and just talk about it other times they don't talk for pages mm-hmm because they're keeping it in, right? They're right. trying to, you know, so it's, 
it's a beautiful, a beautiful thing as an actor to examine um, the characters that are in uncomfortable situations. Right. Right. Yeah. And one of the things I loved about that going off of that is that we hired um, an intimacy coordinator and mental health um, consultant, uh, Carly Wexstein, mm -hmm. because this play, I mean, this movie is so much about um, the story is so much about how do we heal from trauma? How do we recover from abuse and navigate through that as humans? And, mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering how, when you take on a character that is so in so much pain, so much trauma, uh, and inflicts that did, did, how did you decharacterize? How do you release her at the end of the day? Well, I definitely we'll get I remember, to your questions, you guys, after this. Just yeah, so thank you for the questions. Yeah. And this is very simple. It's something that I've developed over the years that started with a tarot card reader when I was an undergrad. I decided, oh, five bucks. Cool. Just gave her five bucks. She, you know, read my cards. We, we were starting to talk. And um, she told me that being a Pisces, that water is very important to me and can be a very powerful tool. And that at any point that I'm feeling disconnected or agitated or, or in trauma situations or anything to wash my hands and mm. if possible, take a shower, like mm -hmm. get as much water around you as at all. I mean, I carry rose water with me all the time, mm -hmm. constantly, you know, spraying myself. So, and I had the privilege of being in a, a few very heavy uh, productions before filming Serpentine Pink and had learned for myself that when I walk off stage, I need to really, um, really undress from that character, not yeah. just literally, right? And so, for example, when I did my Medea adaptation, I would take showers Ooh. after every every show. Medea, your Medea, wash my mm -hmm. face, right? Mm -hmm. And so, same thing with um, with Jamie. I took a bath every night. I'd get back to the hotel, even if it was four thirty, five in the morning. Epsom salts, bubble bath, candles, fresh flowers, music and just take a bath and just like, and just, and get out of it. Yeah. Any um, music in particular? Uh, there was a lot of classical mm -hmm. because I, at night I can't listen to stuff with lyrics cause it kind of gets my brain. Mm -hmm. So Yo-Yo Ma's Cello Suites is one of my biggest uh, from beginning to end. I've seen him perform it twice live. Wow. It is one of my greatest and most favorite um, pieces of music in this world. Also, uh, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis. Oh, from beginning love to it. End. Yeah. So Obsessed. those are the two that go back Obsessed. and forth. Yeah. I use those. I use Miles Davis to grade when I grade essays. He organizes oh, nice. my brain. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, all right. Well, thanks for the questions, you guys. Okay. So Nathan wants to know, Sabina, who or what are your greatest artistic influences? Ooh. Um artistic influence great all of them everybody everybody <laughs> um uh megan you and i are both huge fans of jane campion as a director mm, yes i think uh you know the piano bright star Jane's. power the dog director like just really uh gives my my attention to detail uh self so much satisfaction with her flowing billowy curtains and the close-up on on earth um, gosh, I didn't even think about female protagonists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm in love with musicians. I'm a huge jazz, a hall, I, Billy holiday. I just want to be her when I got to see, not be her. I just want to be with her around her. Yeah. I got to see Audrey McDonald perform Billy holiday. Oh, my God. Um, and I cried through the whole thing. I cried. Through I the whole can thing. imagine. And just talking about somebody who really understood suffering, who was really living in a man's world and just turned it into pure, beautiful poetry. Janis Joplin in the same way. I feel that same thing. Mm -hmm. Somebody who came from something that really used their voice and their instrument. Um, there's so many poets that I just um, admire, Sandra Cisneros. Um, but I would have to say as an artist, besides other artists, I'm so heavily influenced by my family. Mm. family and and the community that I've kind of surrounded myself with it's just um I, I pull a lot from that yeah a beautiful beautiful mm. family and community I love how they're such a big part of your art and your activism as well mm -hmm. um all right great so Sylvia has a question Sabina did anything during the process of prep or filming surprise you about yourself and how you approach your craft Ooh, that's a good one, Sylvia. Hi, by the way. <laughs> in Dallas right now. Getting ready to direct. They're coming. To the, they're coming. 
you're gonna be here. okay great sylvia i'm so glad to see you and your honey oh that's right um what surprised me um the stamina and the way in which film it just requires you to be so on point with filming things out of sequence i used to be very intimidated by film because i would be so in the moment i would forget oh wait did i have the cigarette in this hand or this hand oh no you know and and be too caught up in it but i think having the familiarity with this character over the past decade and having done the piece before and knowing being able to do it with uh the original actors there was i was able to release and but then still keep that uh that specificity and that rigor and attention to knowing exactly how to reset when we had to do another take and i was ready to go i think i went into it very nervous knowing this was a very important and big and beautifully produced piece and then as soon as I put on her jeans and her boot and her black Sabbath shirt and my wristband and the hoops <laughs> and the hat, I was like, oh, we're good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was that was nice to feel that ease with with the demands that that filmmaking yeah. puts on a performer. And I yeah, I just have to, have to say it's, it's so I just am so grateful to the cast and Kristen and you and Olin and Michael who the original from the, the play to have stuck with the story for so long and to have, I mean, just to know it so well. And then, um, and then to have Joy and Gregory come along too and have mm -hmm. um, their, their take on it as well. But um, it was just well, so I remember, I, I just want to jump in real quick. I remember watching an interview we did. So Olan Jones, the great Olan Jones and Michael Harris. Legend. Yeah. Legendary veteran creators what an honor to work with them but I remember when we were we were doing the play and they talked about the first time they read the script and it reminded them of the stuff that they were doing yes in the early heyday of that really bold really visceral heightened language and and you you do have this beautiful dynamic thread right because we mm -hmm. also have that Patti Smith Sam Shepard those are also influences that both of us share and right. having this real like there's a lot of talk these days. What kind of art can we make? We're mm -hmm. living in a world with a lot of trigger warnings, with a lot of cancel culture, and a lot of stuff is like, nope, not right. going to do any shows about this, 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 or this. Not allowed. Like we got to keep people. And it's just like, wow, shoot. What are those conversations? And and so that's why them bringing on the intimacy coordinator for us to really dive into this. There's some pretty heavy material in this film. Yeah, you know, we don't and we don't shy away from it. Yeah, and I think we've everybody the producers and you know, Kristen who got the whole thing going um, for so long. Uh, we've all been so thoughtful of that. And I think that's been really important. We have the reframe stamp, which is really special, yes. uh, which is the gender balance production certi certification and, and just to have um, yeah, everybody on the team who's been so mindful and thoughtful of that is really important because you do take something like from what Olin and Michael were talking about when they, you know, that kind of rigorous uh, 70s, almost Steppenwolf, you know, style theater, you know, like from mm -hmm. True West or um, mm -hmm. they remember. Um, so, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, that kind of, it seems on the surface that it's a very male kind of style, but I loved what Kristen said yesterday about how yes. it's actually very like a feminine divine type of style. And then to have, how do you produce something like that in 2021? You mm -hmm. have the intimacy coordinator, the mental health consultant, you have the, you know, Larissa, the producer's um, social impact uh, priorities of the, her production company. And so I think it's really special, the, the partnerships that we've created to be mindful of that. Because when I'm writing it, it comes from a very emotional, you know, I love this story, but it is a bit emotional for me because it's about how I healed from trauma. So mm -hmm. to see, it's nerve wracking to see people have comments or thoughts about it or whatever, because it is so personal to me. But loving the collaboration of, um, you know, and having Vivian's vision and, um, you know, the producer's vision and everything, how it transforms is really fascinating and, and healing as, as well. Um, well, and to, to have to deal with material that can be that heavy and to look up from a take where there's some really high emotions going on and you just take a moment and we got 
our focuser, our camera woman, it's all women. It was mm -hmm. all women just bringing me my coat when I would be cold. It, and you just look around and there's, there's a magic that happens, y'all. Mm -hmm. There's a magic that happens when you just put women in a room, shit gets done, <laughs> right? And on a level that's amazing. And it, it, was, it was the first time I've ever been on a set like that where everything was run by, it was just this beautiful so crew. Exciting. Mm -hmm. Our production designer, I mean, she was, her attention to detail and just getting to know, I ran into, um, um, I'm not going to remember her name immediately, but she's now living in New Mexico with her wife and she was the one doing, it, it was this conversation between our camera woman and she had the rack focus back here. She knew that if she was going to get closer in, that she had to work, that it's like they had this psychic connection of Ooh. knowing exactly how to focus the camera because, oh, guess what? She's moving in because she had her steady cam rack, you know, and just seeing that communication. That. And it was just this beautiful, you know, um, experience to see such a female forward crew, especially like for that. that intense material. It's very important. It's vital to, yeah, for something like this. I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. Um, well, if anybody has a, la a last minute quick question, um, type it in the comments. But um, thank you so much for doing this, Sabina. Is there yeah, anything you want to talk about that I didn't bring up or? No, I just, I am so excited. I think this is one of those beautiful examples of when you find your tribe and your people, keep them close. I mean, we're mm -hmm. talking a decade's worth of collaboration that turned into now a feature film that's screening on Friday in Los Angeles. So exciting. Hi, Dutch. Hello, Dutch. I love you too. <laughs> um, yeah, I it just, it, I'm so excited and blessed to be a part of it because not only is it a great story on film in its own living world of what it is, but it's a great story of how it came to be. Yes. And I just, I, I can't believe that the day after Can you tomorrow, believe it? Can you no, believe I it? I can't. I can't. <laughs> I'm, you know, getting, trying to figure out what I'm going to wear and just like inviting people. We were texting <laughs> each other possible outfits for the yeah. premiere. Yeah. And just knowing that I'm going to be able to sit in a room and see on the big you. screen um, something that started with you noticing this beautiful hot pink leaf sitting on a concrete sidewalk and if anybody it. wants to see that image just go to megan's uh megan's profile and check out her stories and you'll see that vibrant serpentine pink leaf i love that it was our seed for a while oh, i yeah. printed it out and just put it taped it up above my computer yeah because i just loved it so much we should make yeah. shirts of that oh my god we should totally make sure didn't we make buttons of that we something? made buttons yeah we did make buttons yeah oh thank you cassandra i'm working with cassandra right now your mom wants to know when will it be streaming. We don't know yet. Um, we don't know yet. We're hoping to get, we're hoping to know that soon. We will let everybody know for sure. Thank you, Thea. <laughs> yeah, we will let hoping, everybody know. We want it to do the festival circuit. We would love for it to get around and get to see all the different audiences. And then you got to go through distribution. And so yeah, it takes a while. But amazing that we have a screening just mm -hmm. a little over a year after we actually shot it. Yes, Kim, Anna Mendieta for sure. Oh, Anna, that's a beautiful Cuban artist. Oh, I have to check her out. Yes, you do. You would love her, Megan. Awesome. Very much. Well, thanks, vibes. everyone. Yeah, thank um, you for joining. The premiere is this Friday at, two, at 5 o'clock at, um, at LA Live. But yes, keep follow Serpentine Pink, Serpentine Pink Film on Instagram and um, Facebook. If you follow Sabina, you'll see all the tags and <laughs> mentions and yes. everything. Um, but uh, yeah, we're so excited and thank you for being so vulnerable as Jamie and just really giving us the gift of a performance um, and just for your support for so long. It's been oh, so thank beautiful. Thank you so much. It's crazy because you as a producer, you've gotten to see like a rough cut and I haven't mm -hmm. seen anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for you to see it, for everyone to see it. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, dude. Thank and you. thanks everybody who watched and um, this will be up. So if you want to watch it again or share it, go ahead. And um, yeah, thanks everyone. Awesome. Have a beautiful rest of your Have day and day. love you, Nathan. <laughs> and I will Mwah. see you guys soon. Bye. Bye.